Welcome to Cannabis 360, your source for cannabis and psychedelic industry news, interviews, and insights. Visit canna360.ca and sign up to receive free access to the entire Cannabis 360 catalog. Welcome everyone to this uh, little panel on uh, the international cannabis market. Um, we're going to be taking a look at Europe, uh, but also Asia as well, and uh, getting a bit of an overview from our lovely uh, panelists and guests here today. Um, I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Chris Potasco. I'm a uh, cannabinoid researcher from the UK and uh, consultant in the UK cannabis industry. And uh, I'm joined here by uh, some of my lovely fellow experts. And I'll maybe go one at a time and let you guys introduce each other and uh, just have a little two minute intro as to who you are, what your backgrounds are and what you're up to at the moment. And uh, we'll feed in some questions if that works. So uh, maybe go ladies first, uh, Atia, would you like to... Uh, leaders often will uh, go go to uh, Carl and Deepak as well uh, just afterwards. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so my name is Atia Feroz. I'm the CEO of AgCan Consultancy. Uh, we're an operations and quality assurance focused cannabis consulting agency. Uh, I am based in Canada half of the year, but I actually spend the other half of my year in Europe, predominantly working with international clients, um, which is really exciting because we get to work in such a fantastic emerging market and get to see what it's like in some of the less developed areas. I'm also an instructor for the Academy of Applied Pharmaceutical Sciences for their cannabis certificate program. Um, and then uh, by training, I'm a plant geneticist. So cannabis tissue culture is my jam. Uh, Carl, maybe if you could give us a little uh, rundown of uh, your background, that would be super. I'd be happy to. I'm Carl K. Lin. I'm living currently in Thailand. I'm originally from the United States, but I've been here in Thailand for just about four years now. And uh, during that time, I've been writing a newsletter known as Cannabis in Thailand. And I'm also uh, the founder of uh, Thai Hub of Cannabis, which is a distribution for flowers, uh, most of which comes from the Northeast or the North of Thailand and is distributed here on the island of Phuket. So these two things have been keeping me very busy. I'm doing quite a bit of, or trying to do policy analysis of What's happening in Thailand is kind of putting pieces of the puzzle together because uh, the process has been a little bit confusing and a little bit opaque. But now we're coming to a tipping point where things are going to finally uh, stabilize. And I'm excited about talking about that. Thank you, Carl. I'm uh, excited to discuss uh, Thailand and uh, dig into some of the uh, new progressions over there. And uh, Deepak, I was wondering if you might be able to give us a little rundown as well, sir, last but not least. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me, Deepak Nand. I'm the CEO and co-founder of ASDA Consultancy. I work with a number of companies, both in Europe as well as in North America, just around cannabis uh, business and, and policy. I've, I've worked with a number of countries on policy and, and legalization, starting from Canada, going to the UK, uh, and also in Malta. I've set up my own business uh, that was EU GMP certified in Malta that dealt with distribution of medical cannabis across Europe. So I have quite a bit of familiarity with both the regulatory policy side, but also the business side from an EU GMP perspective and what it takes to be successful in, in European markets. So thanks for having me and look forward to the discussion. Could you give us a bit of a lay of the land, Deepak, as to where things are at in Malta and um, how the government's maybe approached it differently to other corners of Europe? Yeah, for sure. I, I think probably I'll get started with the medical cannabis aspect. So over, you know, about eight years ago, Malta looked very seriously at legalizing medical cannabis and wanted to create an industry out of this. For those that might not be familiar, Malta's always embraced sort of nascent and new and emerging industries and regulated them, whether it be gambling or poker or, or cannabis. So that's the history that Malta typically has with respect to unregulated uh, industries and businesses. They're a pro-business island uh, and like to create policy and regulations around things that are unregulated or or are new, let's just call it, with respect to the, the regulatory framework. So they had a good good foundation from a medical cannabis uh, perspective. There's a number of companies, including one that I founded, that got EU GMP certification. So they they understood and got, got to grapple with all the international trade obligations, et cetera, around medical cannabis, uh, you know, going back four or five years now. Um, just about a year and a half ago, they, they decided to legalize cannabis for adult use for recreational purposes. Uh, it was, it was done more from a social policy experiment perspective as opposed to a mass market perspective. 
obviously Malta being a, you know, a very small country, uh, you know, this is not really good. You know, you're not going to see hundreds of dispensaries everywhere as we see in more developing mar markets like Canada or, or, or the U S in many cases. So they've gone about this from a social equity perspective. They've set the foundation with respect to a policy outcome, which is legalizing cannabis at a European level. They became the first country to actually go ahead and do that. We'd seen a lot of noise from Luxembourg and, you know, Switzerland and, and Germany, of course, but they're the first ones to actually get it done with respect to legislation and policy. So quite a significant step from a regulatory policy perspective. Uh, uh, obviously, licenses have still not been issued, so they're going to start issuing the first social equity licenses. They're looking at the Spanish model uh, with respect to social clubs and making it a not-for-profit model to begin with. And then eventually they're going to start to roll out more of the for-profit dispensary type model as we see in more mature markets why do you think it is deepak and anyone else please feel free to chime in here why is it that malt has been able to make and why do you think they've also gone for such a open-minded maybe more looking at the social equity of the conversation rather than necessarily the economic factors what what has been the sort of fundamental drivers there uh deepak in your Experience. Yeah, so I mean, you know, they've been very pro kind of making sure that, you know, the war on drugs hasn't really worked. They, they've they come to terms with that. I think the Minister of Health back in the day uh, basically said that, you know, we can't really look at arresting people for minor possession of cannabis. And so they needed to come up with a new approach because the existing approach wasn't working. And I think that's a common theme when we look at, you know, newer countries looking to legalize. I think they, they recognize that the existing approach is not working because the cost that these things take on policing, on criminal justice and all of those different aspects is quite significant. So I think Malta looked at it from that perspective. You know, correctly, uh, you know, they, they basically looked at this from a social perspective and which is why I actually give them quite a bit of accolades because they've managed to actually withstand a lot of pressure that they would got from for-profit businesses to set up dispensaries, et cetera, and said, no, we're going to start with this from a social equity perspective. We're going to make sure people that were perhaps incarcerated for cannabis offenses previously are going to be able to be participating in the system. And we're going to decriminalize it so that personal possession is not an issue. Cultivation at home is not an issue. So they looked at all of those different models and start to really get ahead get ahead of it from that social equity perspective. And, and in my opinion, I think that's the right way. Of course, there's quite a bit still that needs to happen uh, with respect to awarding of licenses and cultivation and testing and then the rollout of the program where people are finally getting access to, to legal cannabis in Malta. But nonetheless, uh, definitely first uh, good first steps. Also, Malta being a small jurisdiction, it's fairly easy to start to look at changing and developing legislations when you look at larger EU member states. Things that are a bit more complicated, particularly when you're bordering countries part of the Schengen Agreement, because Malta is an island, it's a bit easier because you, you don't really have this cross-border trade and implication that we're seeing countries like Germany, et cetera, start to you know, grapple with as they think about legalization. On the note of... Uh... Germany there, uh, Deepak, and you've uh, filtered into some of the other talking points quite nicely with uh, your answers so far. Tia, uh, as for the sort of cultivational opportunities and progression, maybe from medical cannabis in Germany through to more, more of this legalized, recreational, maybe decriminalized, socially liberal um, view, what lessons could Germany and the rest of you may be learning from Canada and um, North America and some of the uh, mistakes that have maybe been made over there. How, um, what could we be learning from? There's a lot to take from some of the industries and areas where it's been legalized. Um, definitely having worked in a number of countries now, one of my favorite things to do is really kind of look at the regulations and what they've put a lot of emphasis on and what they haven't put a lot of emphasis on. There's a ton of things that Canada did really well, and there's also a ton of things Canada did not do so you know, great. So um, I think that what I like about Malta and certain other countries and little kind of bits and pieces here, I know New York's another area, right? That's kind of using a little, little bit of social equity as like a baseline. You know, Canada was very strict at the beginning saying that if you did have any kind of criminal record, you couldn't work at a lot of cannabis facilities. You couldn't become a security clearance holder. Some facilities even had that you couldn't be on staff at all. So that really limited anybody that did have any previous cannabis convictions. And then on the side of the social clubs, we still really don't have that in Canada. Consumption lounges are still not something that you can find very easily. And even though it's legal in Canada, there's still a lot of stigma around the use of cannabis and the public use of cannabis. So I do appreciate that some other countries are kind of bringing that on board. So if Germany, you know, because it's such a big trendsetter in Europe, could take that kind of approach to not just legalizing it, but also helping with the normalcy of it and really playing to the decrease in stigma, I think that would be 
very, very big for Europe and essentially all over the world. Uh, the other thing that I, you know, I think all of us who worked in Canadian cannabis are very aware of is flooding of the market. So in every new market that I work in, my biggest concern for my clients, because they're usually all cultivators, is, you know, being able to stay competitive in a market that I know will be flooded in a matter of months or years. It's very common. We see a new market legalized. It gets over flooded with product that they can't shift then they see a huge downturn, then they can't compete because their cost of production is too high. And that's where we're seeing these, you know, rolling bankruptcies, essentially, which has been a huge problem in Canada. So um, there are a few other models out there where they're doing sort of a more agricultural based concept of quotas. I worked in dairy before I moved over to cannabis and quotas is something that people in agriculture are very familiar with, which is, you know, let's say you have a farm and they know the total need is X amount of kilos of product, they, they designate your farm with how much you should be able to produce. Does that eliminate the ability for there to be maybe as much producers? For sure. Uh, but then it means that we don't have the problem that we ran into with Canada, which is, you know, 20 million square feet of cannabis production when we really only needed two. Um, so I, I'm hoping that some of the other countries can look at some of the lessons learned um, that we've had in North America and some of the issues that we've had with legalization now that we're on year four um, since we legalized. Canada is obviously very very developed in the international market in comparison um, and, and kind of pick and choose what they're going to add into their own regulations and their own best practices. I, I think I always like to remind people, you know, we've forgotten many times that legalization is a process and not an event, right? It's not about a date. It's very much about refining this. It's very much about learning and adopting and changing regulations, right? I think in the, in the midst of everything, we've kind of forgotten that to a certain extent. And even regulators are learning as they as they go. Canada had a very tall ask with respect to a promise that was made politically to be able to legalize cannabis. And there was a practical aspect. And there was a number of practical aspects. There was UN treaties, there was cultivation, there was testing, then there was the business uh, demographic side of things. So there's a number of things to be able to tackle. There was the illicit market. Uh, but I think it's important to keep in mind, Canada looked at this from a public health and public safety approach. It's not something that Germany is looking at uh, from a central lens. Obviously, public health and public safety is going to be a, you know looked at quite seriously by Germany, but it's not the central lens through which Germany is going about regulating this. And I think if you look at a number of challenges, uh, for better or worse, for the Canadian uh, process has had is, you know, a lot of the, the regulations stem from that public health and public safety approach. Bureaucrats in Ottawa very early on, you know, said that they would look at this very differently from uh, alcohol and, and tobacco. And often we compare cannabis uh, with respect to what we can and cannot do with alcohol and tobacco. And so if you look at bureaucrats in Ottawa, they'll tell you that we think that alcohol and tobacco are failed public models with respect to public policy. So we want to do something different with cannabis, whether they end up doing that, whether the industry ends up surviving or not through that are, are sort of different questions. But I think Germany really has an opportunity to take from what, you know, the mistakes that have been made in Canada uh, and, and learn from some of the uh, some of the good work that's been done, right? I think when you look at good work that's been done, there's a lot that has happened in Canada with respect to UN treaties and the approach by which we've gone, uh, not complying with UN treaties, but still being part of that UN approach. Germany is going to have to deal with that problem. So there's a page to be borrowed from Canada. Uh, when you look at the black market, when you look at marketing, I would say those are pages not to be borrowed from Canada because, uh, you know, they were challenges and are challenges uh, transitioning uh, illicit market uh, or, or unregulated market producers into legal market. So I think Germany needs to be very pragmatic, whether it be THC limits, whether it be types of products that will be permissible. All of those issues that we've had with respect to transitioning of the legacy market into the legal market in Canada are things that Germany needs to look at very seriously. And I also think from a marketing perspective, they've got to be able to have a pragmatic approach. In Canada, you can't say anything about cannabis, really, if you're a cultivator or a grower. There's very, very little that can be done. Whereas when you're competing with an illicit market, you know, sky's the limit. You can have gummy bears, you can have cough candies, you can have sort of medicines that, that, that are put out. I mean, the sky's the limit with respect to black market. So there's a number of things from a public policy perspective that have not worked and worked in Canada that Germany needs to take and be able to evolve. And, and I don't think Germany is going to get it right from the get-go. I think this is very much going to be a process. I think countries are going to have to band together and start to look at regulations every few years to be able to revise that to come up with a better model. Can I follow oh. up with a question? Can I, I, I have yeah, a yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. I'm particularly interested in what's happening in Germany because I've just been speaking with a, a colleague of mine who's a journalist in Germany, and she has said to me that most predictions of the onset of recreational use in Germany are optimistic and perhaps too optimistic. 
she sees something like a real hesitancy to follow through with producing and allowing a recreational market. There's all of a sudden quite a bit of pushback uh, from policymakers and lawmakers. And I wondered if one of you could speak to that because I'm not an expert on Germany. I was surprised to hear this. Uh, her view is rather pessimistic with respect to when the actual recreational market will get going in Germany. Uh, it, it may be postponed in her view for quite some time. So I would just like to get your views on that. Yeah, happy to touch base a little bit on it uh, from my perspective. So, you know, there's the, again, there's the political side and there's the policy side. So, you know, you've had this existing government get a bit of a, bit of a timeline put on their head with respect to withholding of funds before they'll put out a cannabis program or, or at least a policy. So, you know, the Minister of Health's basically been told, we're going to hold back funding from you unless you're going to look at cannabis policy uh, development and legislation. And so they're really rushing towards setting up a, a policy and regulations uh, from the political side. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I would agree with, with general comments saying that things are going to be slower and take much longer than anything that's been anticipated. I think the Minister of Health in Germany has gone on record saying they're going to see something this year and, and potentially at least see a bill this year. And next year, there'll be a rollout of the program. Uh, if you look historically at the German medical cannabis market, uh, you know, we need to keep things in mind. You know, it took them over five years to be able to give out three licenses to, to, to the tender process, which was revised year over year. So, you know, it's taken them over five years to get a medical program, which by the way, it doesn't look very impressive. It's, you know, the only types of products that you can actually sell in the medical program in Germany are flowers and in cannabis oil. There's no tinctures, there's no capsules, there's no ointments, there's no, you know, there's no pills, there's none of that happening in a medical market, which has been around for several years now. So it's important to keep things in mind. I think as an industry thing, people get very optimistic, investors get very optimistic and start rushing towards setting up a business plan. I think that's one of the mistakes we saw in Canada was before regulations came out, people were already building up, you know, massive facilities to be able to cater to this demand without knowing what are the types of products that you're going to be selling? Are you going to be allowed to sell 1.0 or 2.0 products? Are you going to be, is there going to be a limit on THC? So, uh, you know, I think there is a bit of a cart before the horse. We're certainly seeing this again in Europe, unfortunately, where people are rushing towards doing things in complete absence of regulations. I think if you ask anybody today that is involved with the German recreational program, there's very little that's known with respect to what can actually happen. There's a bunch of speculation, a bunch of people that are speculating on what they think might happen, but the regulator really hasn't said very much with respect to what's going to happen. And it would not surprise me if things do inevitably end up getting delayed or if we look at some sort of a decriminalization process first and then look at a legalization process. Uh, because to keep in mind, you know, not only does Germany have to tackle, you know, cultivation and where that where products are going to come from, they have to tackle the UN issue that I spoke about earlier. But then there's the European Union issue. And the European Union has uh, some specific challenges around legalization of cannabis with respect to the way that the EU framework has been set up. So, uh, you know, there's a myriad of things that, that Germany has got to be able to handle. It would not surprise me. If so I can always tell when something new has been announced for Europe because my LinkedIn inbox gets flooded with messages. And that means that some kind of news article has come out that had said a new European country is coming on board. And I think that the lay person doesn't understand that just because that small, like small advancement has been made, there's so much other things that have to happen after that before we can actually mm -hmm. see it floating around in the market. So I had people the second those articles came out being like, yeah, is Germany going to have product available in June? And I was like, absolutely not. Like there's no chance. Um, so it's, if you don't really understand all the different intricacies, it's, it's so many different departments and so many different regulatory bodies have to come together and so many considerations. And a great point that Deepak brought up was because they're in the Schengen area, this is a whole other ball game. They were allowing free travel for people to move between the whole Schengen area. So if it's legalized in Germany, but it's not legalized in Italy and it's not legalized in France, how exactly are you going to be stopping people at uncontrolled borders? So um, there's a lot of stuff to get sorted out there. I really don't see any time soon like Germany being flooded with recreational product. And also I work six months a year in Switzerland, which obviously borders Germany. So we get a lot of
views and stuff. And to be honest, the general consensus on the stigma around cannabis is a lot higher in Germany than I would say it is in Canada. Canada always kind of had a pretty relaxed cannabis culture. I remember being in school and, you know, if cops caught you smoking marijuana, it was not a big deal. Like it was like, okay, put it out, but it wasn't that big of a problem. Whereas just in the German news, I think the first year I was here, um, a woman was caught and the news is saying, you know, huge pot dealer she had like 30 plants in her backyard like i'm talking like it's not the the level of stigma i think is quite high still and it's something like what i say very similar to um you know people's impression of a market where we don't have any data because it has not been a product available for sale any of these estimates i don't really know what they're basing them off of if you've never had legal data on a market how can you say that you know there's going to be 50 million consumers like what where is the information on that so i think it happens in so many cases everyone wants to be optimistic which is fantastic but when you look at what the real market size is and for different product types you really can't tell until Till we've rolled them out. Um, and then also, you know, looking at different types of product and how approachable they are. Uh, concentrates, for example, are a fantastic product type, but because of the fact that typically you have to have other accoutrements to use them, they're not going to be as big of a boom as, let's say, dried flower pre-roll, which is very accessible, right? So um, I think that it's fantastic. People have a lot of eyes and attention on Germany, but uh, completely agree with Deepak where it's a bit overblown right now. And I think we're really early days to be making any kind of assumptions on how big the market's going to be and, and when there's going to be a recreational product readily and easily available for people in Germany. Legalization processes is making me think of Thailand, Carl. Um, how and what uh, could we maybe be learning from Europe? And what's that process being like for Thailand as well as the uh, I guess the training wheels are sort of just coming off now. Um, yes, yes. What's going on, Carl? Yes, yeah, excellent questions all. Well, I am in the middle of a, a piece uh, that is going to have the title "What Thailand Can Teach North America." So I think that there's <clears throat> a lot that Thailand has learned and has been able to implement rather swiftly in comparison. And one of the things that uh, strikes me the most about how legalization is proceeding in Thailand is how fast they went from medical to the next phase, which is not recreational. And this is a little bit difficult to get your head around in the beginning, but my view is that uh, legalization with Thai characteristics is presenting an alternative to the Western distinction between recreational and medical. It's trying to expand the scope of medical and make it more accessible to the public. And I'm talking specifically now in terms of uh, making flour accessible to the public through dispensaries and clinics, that it looks to me like they want to say no to recreational, but yes to medical with a very light touch so that and this comes really from their history and from their culture and from the fact that they've been working with and using cannabis for about a thousand years now, officially, at least uh, we have a thousand years of medical use documented. And it has always been seen as a medicine, uh, but it hasn't been seen in, as a medicine in the Western sense. Uh, they have reignited uh, the alternative medicine program of Thailand it was originally long ago in the 20s outlawed uh, in the name of bringing in Western medicine. Uh, and then it was kind of reintroduced in the 50s and 60s. But then when cannabis was illegalized by force of the United States in Thailand in the late 70s, well, then they also got rid of most of the alternative medical professionals that were using cannabis as part of their treatment programs. Uh, now they have brought back both cannabis and the alternative medical professionals uh, to create a medical cannabis, which is much more expansive in its conceptualization than anything you see in the West. Now in the West, what I'm most familiar with because I'm from the United States and I've lived in Canada for six years, uh, the West has a very distinct uh, dichotomy that they, they draw between the two. And oftentimes the medical use is, has lots of hoops that the patients have to jump through, lots of regulations involved in providing the product, uh, whereas the recreational is kind of 
a no holds barred, okay, you finally got your free swim, now everyone can jump in the pool. Uh, whereas here in Thailand, they don't even want to use the word recreational. And this has created a lot of uh, confusion. And we've so much so that you've kind of moved into three different camps of understanding what's really happening now in Thailand. Uh, but to be specific and concrete, right now in Thailand, you can walk into any one of 300 new dispensaries across the country and buy any flower you like, as long as you're over the age of 20. Uh, there's no restriction. It sounds a lot like recreational cannabis, but what they've done is they've completely uh, legalized the plant so that it's impossible to be arrested for possession or cultivation or even selling or buying any kind of cannabis. But at the same time, they're bringing in regulations, which they were supposed to bring in on June 8th when they actually legalize the entire plan, but they said they were late. Now, whether or not they were late or whether or not this was truly strategic is unknown to all of us, except maybe just a few players. But the impact that it's had is that you've created this very liberal atmosphere where anyone can buy weed, as long as they're over 20 years old. Anyone knows they can buy weed. And it's actually extended into a kind of gray market or gray area where it's outside of the dispensaries, a lot of the uh, street food vendors will also have pre-rolls available and suggest that you buy one after you buy your, uh, whatever the street food is that you have. So it's very open and you have a lot of ganja trucks that are driving around. Uh, but the th back to the three camps, uh, one side sees this as great and something that's going to go on and they want to get in now and make the money that they can. And there's a, a great deal of money being made, relatively speaking, uh, by these kind of cowboys who are just taking advantage of the fact that the regulations are not here. Now there's another camp on the other side of the spectrum that's saying all of this is going to get wiped out, that uh, the uh, law enforcement is going to come down really hard on people uh, irresponsibly selling, providing, marketing, flowers, talking mainly about flowers, that's the controversial item. The other items aren't that controversial. Uh, but that group is saying that they're going to shut, almost as if they're understanding the whole program from that Western point of view, of it's either recreational or it's medical. They're gonna shut down all of this freewheeling uh, flower sales and get back, back to a tight medical system where there are no flowers, where it will just be, you're providing CBD and hemp products, anything over 0.2% will be illegal. And then there's a third camp, which is a camp that I think is the one that's winning out just by what I see on the ground, which is this expansion of the medical. Uh, so they've just in the past week, in fact, uh, my sources have kind of concluded and, and have convinced me that their conclusion is correct that a few things are gonna to happen to make this expanded view of medical, which kind of cancels out recreational, happen very soon. And by very soon, I mean by the end of September or mid-October, you'll see regulation that says all of these dispensaries, you know, you're, you're, you're perfectly uh, able to stay open as long as you have an alternative medical professional in every dispensary. Hmm. That's someone working there full time. Most of them are open now seven days a week, some six days a week, about nine to 10 hours a day. And they're selling flour. They've got other products. They've got tinctures and CBD products, but where their profit center is, is absolutely clear. It's in uh, high grade boutique flowers. Uh, most of these dispensaries will have between 12 and 20 different uh, flowers to choose from. Uh, but soon everyone will have to have a professional. And these professionals, these alternative medicine professionals have had included in their uh, coursework, which is a four year course they have to take, have had included cannabis as treatment, cannabis as medicine. It's been included to their bag of tricks, which just before legalization did not have any cannabis studies. Well, they anticipated cannabis being a product in uh, Thailand. So they started this about two to three years ago. 
keep in mind that even uh, medical cannabis just started in 2018. And uh, the, the more open uh, regimen that allows flour to be sold everywhere just started in June, on June 9th this year. So they are now coming into all of the dispensaries and law enforcement will come by eventually. This is the idea, how well it's executed is another question or how, uh, you know, how they blanket 200 brand new operations is unclear, but it'll be the policy. And I think that most people will want to follow the policy. Uh, they'll have to hire on uh, an alternative medical specialist. So that'll be a blow to their profit margin. But at the same time, the other new regulation that accompanies it is that all consumers will have to have a medical marijuana card. And this card costs a thousand baht, or, or this is, again, just a proposal. It's nothing set in stone, but it's already uh, being test marketed with some of the, uh, the franchises that are closer to the government and closer to the policymakers that really want to be on the cutting edge and innovative about working with the policy and working with the regulations. So these groups are already implementing the card and as kind of a test trial, this card will, is, will be valid for a year, be uh, valid anywhere within the country. And with it, you can travel anywhere with as many, pretty much as much flour as you can take in your luggage, be able to fly with it. Uh, so the, the idea is that your uh, access to the card will be easy. Uh, if you can explain to a medical practitioner who's already an alternative medical practitioner why you need cannabis, uh, you'll get the card uh, within five minutes of entering any dispensary and then with that card be able to purchase anything they have for sale. So that's what's happening with that. I, I, I'm very positive and optimistic about it all. I think the transition will be uh, a fluid one. Uh, I don't see uh, real heavy handed uh, law enforcement coming down. It's just a question of whether or not you can afford this, but really they're going to pay for themselves because each card costs a thousand baht, a thousand baht which is, again, this is relative. This is a middle income country. It's about $28. It's under 30 US dollars to get this card for the year. So those are the two big regulations that are coming down the pike within the next four to six weeks, which will really change this market and create what I think is really the only uh, policy of its kind worldwide, which is saying, yes, this is medical, but it's also very easy to get. And that's accompanied with uh, the regulation that's going to stay in place, which is already in place, that anyone can grow 15 plants of any kind of cannabis they want, uh, as long as they register on, a, on a, the government sponsored app, which is free, it takes about two or three minutes, there's no uh, verification that takes place. You're just registering your name, uh, registration number. Uh, if you're a, a foreign born chap like I am here, you, uh, you don't have a, a special uh, Thai ID, but you'll be able to use the number that you've been given on your medical cannabis card to apply or, or just to let them know, really, it's not even an application. You're just registering, you let them know, and then you're fine with growing your 15 plants at home as well. So, All this talk of progress and uh, international movement towards legalizations make me feel pretty depressed about the UK at the moment. And uh, how Yes, you should be. Shame on the UK. I can't believe no, I, what you're going through. It's really, really tough. Yeah. For a nation that prides itself on being innovative and at the front of the modern world we're really caught in a knot at the moment with some of our um, regulations so from, and we have from my perspective in thailand you know i i can't help but feel that you know again what thailand can teach the west uh including great britain is there is so much stigma there that we just don't have there's really no stigma uh, there's some stigma, I say that, you know, I don't want to exaggerate, some of the uh, older generation that had been fed really American propaganda uh, that was given directly from the CIA and the FBI to law enforcement in Thailand 
to proliferate across the country, which it did, uh, the older people, the older generation, and this is much older, like 70s, you know, and a lot of the lawmakers are in their 70s and even 80s. So it has some effect, it has some drag effect. They have been influenced by this propaganda and they hold a stigma, but I don't know any younger people, professionals or lawmakers or anyone who really take seriously the this, this strong stigmas that you still see, uh, well, in all over the West. I don't know anything about Malta, I'd be interested to hear, but I know in, in Britain and still the UK and Canada, uh, you still struggle with that. And may, maybe you always will, it's unfortunate. I think we have a big emphasis on um, this almost, well, maybe a dichotomy between medical and recreational. And I find it really interesting how Thailand's just sort of smashed through that. And these are just social constructs, they're just words that, but in reality and sort of practicality, it's all the same consumption. It's just, I suppose, how we frame it legally or from a policy standpoint. Um, I, I, at I quite the moment, agree, I agree with that completely. You know, I, 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 I would just amplify that and say that yeah, in, the, in uh, Thailand, you just don't see that legalistic distinction at all. In fact, uh, the other aspect of this is that recreation itself, even as an abstract concept, is not something that really grabs uh, the Eastern mindset. Uh, certainly here in Thailand, and I think generally in Asia, the idea of recreation sounds like really lazy and like what, what anti-social troublemakers do, they recreate, you know? So, so if anything, recreation has a stigma, uh, but cannabis doesn't. So no one wants to say that, you know, they're going to go home and engage in recreation. It just sounds decadent and lazy and sloppy. And, uh, and, I, and I'm making generalizations, but I think that's one of the reasons why you just don't see that distinction catching on. It was a legalistic distinction after all. It was made specifically as a way of working around federal laws, right? And particularly in the, in the United States uh, and to get marijuana as they would call it then, medical marijuana on the table so that they could begin a slow walk to something called recreational. And uh, that whole legal distinction just doesn't uh, grab the imagination over here at all, which I think is a great thing. You know, it, it leads to a healthier attitude and atmosphere. One of the things that was actually just mentioned to me by a uh, manager of a dispensary who is sharing one of the persons who knows a lot about the industry and has been sharing these thoughts with me is that they're very happy about the idea that they have uh, that they will have, you know, they're, they're having to adjust their budgets, but they will have an alternative medical professional on hand. Because one of the things uh, that gets kind of uh, falls between the cracks, certainly in the discussion in the U.S. and Canada, is that some people really are uh, allergic to different strains of cannabis. And once you go into the recreational realm, it's as if you want to deny that. And I think that's a shame because, you know, real cannabis use is all about being honest about what this plant is. And uh, if someone breaks down, or feels like, you know, there's this idea that some people will smoke or especially with an edible that they're not experienced with, feel like they're going to die, you know, they're already warned of these possible side effects by the alternative medical pr practitioner who's providing them with their first uh, real cannabis or THC cannabis, I'm speaking particularly with things with, that have high, uh, higher levels of THC. And they're you know, told very clearly to come right back to the medical professional and they're gonna provide them with some herbs or maybe some CBD or depending upon how their negative reaction has played out, they're gonna give them additional organic treatments in order to help them. So whereas the recreational user is kind of left out in the dark. Sounds like a more so, holistic approach, Carl, rather than quite. Yeah. 
Deepak, do you have a few points to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, Christopher, and I don't think we are doing this here, but we need to be very careful before we start to give accolades to any country for having the perfect legalization model. I'm not suggesting that we are here. In fact, I think there's definitely things that we can you know, learn from Thailand, particularly around social justice reform, where they basically pardoned a number of prisoners that were arrested. So you know, the social policy side is, is definitely you know, a big one. But I couldn't help but cringe a couple of times when I heard some of the things that Carl was saying, because people that don't remember the Canadian process, that's exactly where we started. You could have whatever you wanted. You could go to a doctor and basically, you know, get prescribed medical cannabis for any reason. And then you could have how much ever cannabis you want. Well, lo and behold, next thing you know, you know, you were you were being prescribed thousands of grams a day for cannabis. Then you had a legal permit to possess that cannabis. And then we saw some infiltration of the uh, legacy and, and unregulated and black market fall into this, where you've now basically got a license to be able to either possess or cultivate a significant quantity of cannabis that is definitely above what somebody can consume in a single day. And now you're having to put the cart, the genie or the toothpaste back in the bottle, as the, as the old saying goes. And you'd know this from the UK, where CBD is much like the same issue now, where you're trying to regulate something that's effective being unregulated for so long, now you're going to go to Holland and Barrett and Boots and basically try and take these products off the shelf. It's going to be very difficult to do that. So I think we just need to be very careful around giving accolades to the perfect model. I don't think the perfect regulatory model exists today. I think there's certainly some really good things that are happening in places like Thailand and Europe and Canada that we need to sort of start to look at kind of, you know, shaping together. I mean, it's unfortunate that in Thailand, all you can use is flour because as soon as you talk about concentrates or extracts, forget it. Once you go up, you know, be above the 0.2% THC, you can't extract anything out of that product. So, uh, you know, there's a number of things that still need to be uh, taken in mind when regulatory processes are set up. I mean, there's the whole consumption issue in Thailand. So, I mean, there's, you know, there's a number of issues uh, in each of these models that kind of need to be fixed out. So I just wanted to make sure that we weren't leading people down a certain way saying, you know, this is the, is the best model, because at least in my opinion, I don't think we've seen the best model evolve yet. I think we will soon, but I don't think we were there yet. Well, just one thing I wanted to say with respect to Carl uh, and the notes on Thailand is just um, I do appreciate that they're going to have trained people at the dispensaries because that is a huge problem. Uh, and in Canada, the bud tenders, for example, are extremely limited on what they can say. So if you go in and say, like, I need help with sleep, they're actually not allowed to really tell you products can help with sleep unless that product has uh, been marketed in that way. And they get around it usually by adding chamomile or other herbal extracts to the product. So it's like a CBN product, which we have, you know, has very recently been like lauded for sleep benefits. But to get around that, what they do is add chamomile and lavender to those products so they can actually put sleep something on it. Otherwise, if it's just a straight CBN product, they're actually not allowed to say anything. So the biggest thing I get questions about is people who just know that I'm in cannabis and will just say, I have this problem, that problem, that problem, and the information is not accessible. So um, there needs to be a thousand percent way more research. The amount of research on endocannabinoids has, is very low, um, in my opinion. Um, and then I think, you know, Chris and I have talked about the fact that there's a very large sex difference as well. Uh, the amount of research that's been done in women, for example, and there's a very distinct interaction between estrogen and cannabinoids is very very little. Um, so there's so much more research that has to be done. And like, you know, as a scientist myself and a plant scientist in particular, I'm very much for that research and the availability of that information. I think it's, it's a complete crime that any country would ban their staff from using scientific based articles and things that we have repeatable, you know, information in that, you know, you know, don't take one paper and run with it. But if we've got enough evidence in something, the government should be the one or at least enlist the help of somebody else to allow us to speak freely on those benefits, because it really limits the amount of people that will use products if they can't get access to information. And we can't expect the consumer to go and read a bunch of scientific articles on their own. Um, so I do like that they have somebody at each dispensary, because, yes, in Canada and many other places, you can get medical, um, but they don't make it very easy for you to get that information. And they don't really have it, uh, you know, right there at the store on the spot where you can get the medical card right there. You've got to like call in advance, you've got to set up some kind of meeting, you've got to like send in your prescriptions, or you have to have some kind of video call. So it, it really it does create a small barrier um, to having access to that product. So that is one thing I'll be in Thailand in car um, in May, Carl, so I'll look you up, but I would love to see how that's uh, functioning by then. Excellent. You say you'll be here in May? 
Well, actually, I'm waiting to see when <laughs> Cannabis Business Asia is. Is it in March or May? I can't remember now, but, but I'm coming up for that conference. Okay, great, great. I'm not sure which month it is, but do look me up. That'd be great. Will do. Because I think it, it, the question is, you know, when will this really take shape? We'll really be able to describe what's happening rather than you sort of anticipate what we feel is going to happen. And that's not going to be that long from now. I mean, it'll be the beginning of uh, 2023, uh, things will be starting to really shake out, I think. So, yeah. A couple of quick fire, I say one question, but some quick fire answers maybe from each of you for this one. Um, in the UK, we have all this wonderful access now, but we don't have any legal consumption sites. We do have these underground cannabis clubs, patient communities that existed before the law and they still exist. And there are some self-sustaining communities, sort of like the clubs in Barcelona. Um, and I know Canada's got a, an improving, I guess, consumption um, structure. Atia, maybe if you lead us off as you are in the home of cannabis consumption at the moment, uh, well, Toronto, move it, or uh, were, sorry, before we got to Switzerland um move around too much to you um uh, just a quick few thoughts from each of you would be wonderful on just what we could maybe do to make some of that consumption safer facilitate it better and um yeah maybe some lessons we could learn um for our audience as well consumption lounges are nothing new they've been around for ages right and even canada toronto there's there was kindred cafes like a huge one that everybody knew about it was around for a very very long time very good reputation um so it's definitely something that we need to bring back because the culture around cannabis and cannabis consumption if those kinds of spaces get legalized um it allows for more of a safe space it allows for more of a social aspect uh right now if you have to you know consume your cannabis at the side of a sidewalk before you enter into a restaurant there's nowhere else really comfortable for you to consume um i think it just kind of increases the stigma a little bit and it makes it a bit more rough on the consumer. So I am very excited to see uh, more consumption lounges opening. Um, there's a ton of fantastic consumption lounges already established, again, albeit mostly in the legacy market around the world, but um, I'll be popping into some of the clubs in Barcelona in two weeks. So I'll be doing a little bit of research while I'm there on uh, some of the uh, more desirable aspects of those club setups. Uh, it's funny in Canada because I, I'm sorry in uh, in Thailand. I was thinking about Canada when I was there. It was this. I was there many years ago, and it felt like uh, cannabis had been completely legalized at that time. But in any event, in uh, Thailand, it's funny because a lot of uh, press has been given to the fact that you can be arrested for smoking cannabis in public. This is more of a uh, a nudging, a social nudging to let everyone know. You know, it's not okay to be seen in public smoking cannabis, to be smoking weed. Um, so they have come up with uh, consumption lounges, a very, what I think liberal regimen is for a regime is for that. Uh, any dispensary right now can have a consumption lounge if they wish, it's not mandatory. And it looks like as a transition over into becoming all clinics, that those consumption lounges will stay. Uh, and in addition to that, there's just a cultural mood that I have witnessed because I've made a point of going out to, to see what's happening. Uh, that if there is, for example, a clinic that's rather small, and a lot of these spaces are small spaces, uh, there's no room for a consumption lounge. It is mandatory that the consumption lounge be separated from the actual place where you purchase. So it has to be another room. It can't be the same place. Uh, but if there's not enough room for that, there's oftentimes a cafe very close where you could go in the back and smoke weed. Uh, again, they may crack down on that aspect, but Thailand, as particularly in the cities and particularly where the tourists like to congregate, is pretty free wheeling in general anyway. So it's not as if there's going to be, you know, SWAT teams around areas where there are clinics and cafes where they're smoking some, some grass. So uh, that said, consumption, I don't think it's, I, no one really sees it as a problem, uh, but it is important, you know, again, uh, to, to mention to anyone who's coming to, to Thailand who is a, a weed user to just play it safe and never smoke on the streets. 
So that's where they are. You can be arrested for causing a nuisance by smoking your weed on the street corner. And you can be charged a lot of money. So that is, you know, thinking realistically about Thailand and how law enforcement does operate. This would be an excuse to arrest uh, foreigners and perhaps, you know, find a way to provide a way out for them for a certain amount of money, right? But this is the last uh, sort of area where that's possible because the bottom line is no one can be arrested for possessing cannabis or weed right now in Thailand. But if you smoke it, you could find yourself in some trouble if you do that in a public place. You know, still remains a major issue depending on the province that you're in, in Canada at least. There's certain provinces that haven't allowed it yet. Some are some are considering it. Uh, so I think consumption launches are probably the most interesting thing that you'll probably see in Canada coming up next. Uh, there's definitely a lot of appetite towards moving towards having consumption spaces. And I think it's critical and it's very important for people that are consuming cannabis to be able to have an area in which they can they can consume safely. So, you know, definitely look forward to that uh, from a Canadian perspective. I think uh, on the UK side, you asked the question around what can be done. I think there's just so much that still needs to happen. I mean, you know, I think there was a survey just last week where a majority of Brits didn't even know medical cannabis was legal, right? Was it 70 some percent weren't aware of that? So, you know, we've got to start there. GP prescribing is going to ha- is gotta happen. I think there's just a number of things that need to still happen in the UK. I'm very optimistic, actually, about the UK market. I think that because it's been so tightly controlled for such a long time, it could only get better from here. Obviously, it's anyone's guess, particularly with the new government now on, on what that timeline looks like. But uh, it's also a market from a medical perspective that's actually the most interesting because it's going to grow the fastest. Uh, and I think once we get around GPs prescribing, get around this education issue, I think that market will start to open up. And, and hopefully we talk about recreational cannabis in the not too distant future. Thank you everyone for your lovely contributions today. Um, we may have skipped over a few topics, but obviously um, if you have enjoyed any of the talk and you do want to ask any of the speakers any more questions about their uh, respective areas, I'm sure all of their details will be just below us in the uh, Cannabis 360 conference and you can uh, speak to everyone in your own time and uh, yeah, get into some more, uh, more detailed conversations and um, hopefully you can catch uh, some of us at different conferences around the world over the next few uh, months and weeks as well. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for your uh, contributions and everyone watching. I hope you really enjoyed this uh, panel and uh, yeah, a very insightful international view and look at all the opportunities that are out there. So uh, I think the tone was optimistic. We uh, covered a few negative points, but overall, um, I think everyone's uh, looking forward to the next few years and uh I am especially. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. And we'll see you all soon. Right up. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.